Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for the USGS public lecture. We are happy you have taken an interest in USGS science. My name is Mitch, and I will be your host and moderator tonight. I have some quick announcements to make before I introduce our speaker. If you are watching this from a desktop computer and need to turn on closed captioning, please look at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen for the closed caption icon. It's the one with the two small Cs. You can also use stream text for captioning. Please see the stream text link provided in the question and answer window. Another feature of this Teams platform is you can use the question and answer panel to submit questions at any point during the lecture. Just look for the question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We encourage you to submit questions all throughout the lecture as you think of them. Then at the end of the lecture, we will try to get to all of your questions, but depending on how many come in, we may not have time to answer every one, but we will do our best. And now it's time to introduce you to our speaker. Sarah K. McBride is a social scientist and crisis communication response leader with 18 years progressive experience in risk, hazard, science communication, public education, disaster risk reduction, community resilience, and international humanitarian response. She is a social scientist with methodology experience in mixed methods and a specialty in content and critical analysis. Her professional communications accomplishments include serving public information as serving as a public information manager for earthquakes in both New Zealand and Puerto Rico. Her extensive international and domestic on-site crisis communication and emergency management experience includes work in New Zealand, the Solomon Islands, Samoa, Fiji, Nambia, Hawaii, and Washington. She is proficient in French and Solomon Island Pigeon. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah. Oh, I think you're muted, Sarah. Can you see my slides? They are coming up right about now. There you go. Great. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Mitch and Christy, uh, for your incredible work on uh, supporting the public lecture for the US Geological Survey. Uh, my name is Sarah McBride. I am a research social scientist at the Geologic Hazard Science Center and the Earthquake Sci uh, Science Center. I just started the Geologic uh, Hazard Science Center this week. Um, but before then, I worked at the ha uh, Earthquake Science Center in um, Moffett Field, California. So I'm going to be talking tonight about how we use social science, particularly my discipline, which is communication and media studies, uh, to inform how we can better communicate hazards and risks at the U.S. Geological Survey. I just want to take on a couple of disclaimers. Um, first, uh, any use of trade or firm or product names is for descriptive purposes only and does not imply endorsement by the US government. Also, I'm going to be showing some videos tonight um, that show people responding in earthquakes. If you have experienced earthquakes like I have, I've been in a very I've been in a couple very large earthquakes myself. Um, you may find this content uh, distressing and the videos and images distressing. I will give everybody a warning before I play the videos, so you can choose to step away if you do not want to watch these videos. So tonight I'm going to be talking about natural hazard social science research in the U.S. Geological Survey. And what are some of the challenges in communicating about natural hazards like earthquakes and its related sciences? I'm going to be using case studies featuring ShakeAlert, which is the earthquake early warning system for the West Coast United States, and that includes Washington, California, and Oregon. And I'm going to be talking about some published research and its impacts. So first, if you're new to social sciences, welcome. <laughs> um, so what is social sciences? Well, 
this is a, a pretty broad definition that I, I use pretty frequently, but it's a, syst a systematic study of people, their society, governments, social, cultural, communication, geographical, and economic structures. But what do the social and behavioral sciences have to do with the work at the US Geological Survey and Natural Hazards? Well, we've been given some legislative responsibilities. Um, Congress established the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, NEHRP, in 1977. And this is a coordinated act that includes four different agencies of which the US Geological Survey is a part of. Um, and it is that act is to address three things, understanding the hazards and assessing the risks, mitigating the hazards by facilitating hazard resistant structures and develop and warnings about the hazards so actions may be taken to reduce risks. Particularly in 2018 and the work that I do, the USGS was directed by Congress um, to develop earthquake early warning capacity. Um, and this is, uh, this is from a report written by the Congressional Research uh, Service in 2022. So now that we've established that there's reasons for why social science is important because of our congressional mandate, um, it's also important to look at what kind of disciplines look at disaster research at the US Geological Survey. Now, I specialize in communication and media studies, but I wanna tell you that there's a number of different disciplines that work uh, on natural hazard risks at the US Geological Survey and outside of it. So there's communication, which is my discipline, but then there's also emergency and disaster management, geography, public health, sociology, earth science, engineering, psychology, ethics and philosophy. I have worked with anthropologists as well, among many, many other dis different disciplines. And so it's very broad in terms of who is interested in studying people and the systems that they are in when it comes to disasters, natural hazards, and understanding natural hazards risk. But I wanna give a little bit of personal context before I get into some broader questions. Why does someone become a disaster researcher? It is not probably one of the most normal uh, research topics that someone can be interested in over time. And why do I care about this work? Well, um, as Mitch mentioned, I've had pretty broad experience overseas in disasters. Um, particularly one event was very complicated to work in, which was the Christchurch earthquake in February, it was February 22nd, 2011, where I was the public information manager second in command for some, but not all of the, of the early response in that event for about 12 weeks. And before that event had occurred, I had been the public education and public information officer for the Canterbury Civil Defense and Emergency Management Group. The Canterbury Group served uh, the Christchurch, Christchurch city. And one of the things that struck me from that event was that as a part of emergency management, I had been creating booklets and brochures and information so people could understand their seismic risk. But whenever I was in that response mode, I kept on hearing from people, well, no one told us that could happen here. We all thought it was going to happen in Wellington. We all thought the big one was going to happen somewhere else. We didn't think it would happen to Christchurch. And I thought, wow, I have failed. I have failed at my job. And so I became passionate to understand why earthquakes are so complicated to communicate and what are the key factors that we need to consider when talking to people who don't have that kind of experience to understand earthquakes. So that is why I do what I do. And I care about this work because I wanna help reduce human suffering to disasters. That is why I care about this work. And I think a lot of my colleagues at the USGS have the exact same passion and drive. So now that I've established why I do this work and why the USGS does this work, I wanna talk about some broad lessons that we've already learned from risk and crisis communication literature. So, one of the things that I always get is that, oh, the public is just lazy or they're just, they don't care. We have to dumb down information because they're uneducated. And actually, there's really very little evidence of that. The, the, the public is not lazy or apathetic or uneducated. In fact, there's no one general public. Um, in my field, we call them publics instead of public because of the diversity of different groups of people. What the evidence suggests around risk and preparedness, 
two natural hazards um, is that people are really busy, actually. Um, and I think anyone listening to this tonight, so thank you so much for being here because I know how busy you are. A lot of people have differing priorities. And seeing the public as one massive group is a problem because different groups require a variety of different information at different times and in different channels. One of the things that physical scientists really love is numbers and social scientists love numbers too. Um, but just because we get the numbers right and we tell people the numbers doesn't mean that people will understand or respond to those numbers. Numbers are rarely persuasive to get people to change their behavior or adjust their behavior in any meaningful way. Another tactic that I often hear is comparing risks. Have you ever had anyone go to you and be like, you know, you're more like, I know maybe you're afraid of flying, but you're more likely to be killed on the way to the airport, driving to the airport, than you are if um, you're actually in an airplane. But evidence, I, I've never found that approach very reassuring, and evidence suggests that is true. Um, it is not actually reassuring. Comparing risks and showing people that they've accepted similar risks in the past is really ineffective. Now, why do I have a picture of a cow and a shark on my slide? Which one of these two creatures kills more people in the United States and associated territories every year? Well, then ask yourself, which one do we fear more? Sharks kill on average two to five people every year, and cows kill between 22 and 30 people every year. So cows are the real killer here, but we don't watch movies called Utters. We don't live in fear of cows. What we do, uh, we are afraid of sharks, and why? Well, sharks appeal to some of our deepest fears as human beings. When we're in the shark's environment, we're in the ocean, we can't see the bottom, we're in an unfamiliar environment for many of us. Not all of us fear sharks, but we're more likely to fear sharks because sharks look inherently scary. And I mean, look at it, it they, they look more inherently scary. So comparing, but you're not gonna compare sharks to cows, right? You're not gonna be less scared of sharks because cows kill more people. So comparing risks we find doesn't really work. And that's from Slovak's research and Fischoff's research as well. The other one, and I get this a lot from my emergency management colleagues, is that we just need to scare people enough. We just need to grab their attention because we're in an attention economy and we need to, you know, get as, as inflammatory as possible and scare them. And what the evidence suggests is that works for a very short amount of time. And then people tend to shift once they get out of that fear mode. And then they view that work oftentimes with a lot of skepticism. And that can create anger from various publics towards the fear-inducing agency because nobody really likes to be scared. So talking about the big one in really big, broad, inflammatory terms might work for a very short period of time, but it won't engender long-term behavior change around preparedness for earthquakes. So we also know from scientists around communicating the risk and not the hazard. So it's one thing to say, hey, there is an, an earthquake potential in this town. But it's another thing to say, here's what this means. Here's what, here are the potential impacts. Again, without being too inflammatory, but being clear, here's what are the potentials that could happen. But also, if you're going to give people bad news about their situation, what you what it really is critical to consider is around giving people immediate actions they can they can take to improve their uh, their situation. So what this looks like, and I'll show an example of where we've done this at the USGS, is with our aftershock forecasts when a big earthquake occurs, and we say be ready for more earthquakes. The next message we give immediately is around protective actions that people can take when they feel shaking. Because we don't wanna tell people bad news without giving them information on what they can do with that bad news. Then another challenge that we have is understanding that science and the science agencies you work in, even the US Geological Survey, has cultures. Sometimes the U.S. just, I would argue, has multiple cultures, right? Because different teams address each other in different ways. 
And that can be great, right? Uh, you know, we create unique languages and terms and concepts. Um, but remembering that that can also have exclusion, uh, exclusionary aspects to it as well. Sometimes scientists just talk to each other in specific channels, in conferences and in journal articles. And this can create a sense of isolation and even echo chambers. And sometimes scientists can base their communication on impressing colleagues rather than interacting with people and giving them information. And this is from uh, Bruno Latour's work and Aikenhead as well. So this is, not, uh, this is not me saying it, this is just what the evidence suggests. So this is another barrier that sometimes even scientists can create when we speak in jargon and use acronyms and use terms that can be difficult for people to understand. So how does social science address these challenges? Well, this brings me to some of my um, some of my case studies, like ShakeAlert. I won't go into the specifics of how ShakeAlert works. Um, if you live in Washington, Oregon, and California, um, we can. There's online information on ShakeAlert. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about earthquake early warning uh, with global and local perspectives. Right now, earthquake early warning systems around the world, it's just having a moment. It just is. There are earthquake early warning systems popping up all over the globe right now. Um, this is a, a graphic from a paper that I was first author on in 2022, and it's a timeline of earthquake early warning systems globally. The first one was in Mexico City in 1991, um, and that one was a response to the earthquake in 1985 that killed thousands of people in Mexico City. And what they did is they put a series of, of uh, monitoring equipment in their their most commonly known earthquake source, which is about which when they did that, they could account for two to three minutes of warning, which is fantastic. Um, and they've had that system and it's been running for a number of years. Then we start to see the timeline ramp up a little bit. We see um, limited. So um, just to give you a bit of information, if this chart is hard to read, green is public alerting, yellow is limited alerts, and red is real time testing and development. So we see Italy doing some limited alerts, um, and then we see Mexico broadening out its system in 2004, 2005. And then we see Japan getting a, a very robust earthquake early warning system in 2006. And again, then we start to see these bubbles happen in 2015 with the South Korea and Taiwan and Sichuan, China. And in 2019, in October 2019, um, the Shake Alert system went live public alerting in California. Now, there were so many earth new earthquake early warning systems in 2021 that it had to have its own line separate from the rest of the timeline. Um, and Oregon launched in March 2021 for Shake Alert. And then the United States, then in Washington, it was May um, of 2021, which meant the whole system was now is now complete in terms of its alerting for the West Coast, the United States. The yellow in New Zealand and Greece is the Google Android system that works on smartphone accelerometers. And now there are many more countries that have earthquake early warning due to this system. So. One of the critical things that we wanted to understand at the U.S. Geological Survey, if we're meant to fulfill, you know, the, the warning aspect of what we're what we're charged to do, is we need to understand our public's needs. And again, notice I use the word "publics" with an S. Uh, needs and expectations from the system. It's critical to the long-term success of ShakeAlert. I want to take a, just a tiny step back here and talk about major USGS funding on earthquake social science previously, because this wasn't the first time that the US Geological Survey had funded social science. It started way back in the 1970s and 1980s with the earthquake prediction park field experiment. Um, and there's a whole history there, but the USGS funded Dennis Maletti, uh, one of the most renowned and globally leading disaster researchers, to run a, a, a program in Parkfield around people's understanding around earthquakes and preparedness in Parkfield and the surrounding areas there. And he wrote a book about it with Sorensen and worked with Jim Goltz as well. I'm going to be naming some um, other social scientists in this field. Um, and then in 1989, Loma Prieta in 1994, there was uh, funding rounds and support um, for work around people's behavior um, and what kind of actions that they took. And that was uh, predominantly led by Kathleen Tierney as well as Dennis Maletti and, and Sorensen. 
Then we have the Trinet studies, which is really interesting because Trinet was shake alert before shake alert. It was an exploratory project in Southern California. Um, and that they had a social science component of it where they asked people what they thought of earthquake early warning in Southern California. And people were like, we don't know because we didn't know a system like this could exist. Um, and because a system like this didn't exist yet, but we were just trying to figure that out. And that was led by um, Kimberly Shove, uh, Kathleen Tierney and Jim Golds. Then we had the Great Shakeout, and I hope people uh, know about the Great Shakeout. It, from the Great Shakeout, many incredible things have happened, including the Shakeout drill, which is the largest earthquake drill in the world. And again, Dennis Maletti was um, involved in that as well. And then the Hayward scenario in 2016, and these were all USGS funded earthquake scenarios. Then we had some induced seismicity funding in the, in the Midwest states as well. And then we had a, a series of earthquake early um, shake alert projects with Aaron Burkett, uh, the Selnows, Deanna in particular, um, and, uh, and uh, Dennis Maletti was involved and Michelle Wood too um, at um, California State Long Beach. Um, then in 2019, it was determined because we had this new charge from Congress that we actually needed to bring a group of a broad group of social scientists together. So part of my job has been to be the social science coordinator for Shake Alert, and I'll talk a little bit about the composition of that group in a moment. But our priorities in terms of communication, education, outreach and technical engagement look like this. Our first priority is public safety preparedness and resilience. The second one is around technical implementation and engagement. The third one is around consistent messaging and communication. The fourth one is around integration with other federal and state earthquake hazard products. And the fifth one is around educational resources development and dissemination. Now, here are some of the goals of the Social Science Working Group. Um, and what our job really is around supporting social and behavioral science research that informs the operation and implementation of ShakeAlert. Through this, we can contribute to the USGS and the global research community regarding the evolution of social science regarding ShakeAlert. One thing that's really unique about the SSWG is that previously, uh, funding mechanisms focused on funding one or two researchers and instead we took a much broader view and I'll, I'll show you how broad in a moment um, and then our, our our other role is to support support the joint committee of communication education outreach and technical engagement so let me tell you about our researchers we have anthropologists sociologists geographers social psychologists operational and decisional decision science researchers computer scientists communication and media studies researchers like myself, science education researchers, emergency management researchers, building and civil engineers, and public administration researchers have all been involved. We even have a seismologist on the team for the social science working group, um, and uh, it's a really transdisciplinary effort. We have over 48 researchers from universities across the United States and associated territories, as well as researchers from around the world, including Japan, New Zealand, and Europe. Um, so we have a we take a really, really broad approach here. We didn't want just one scientist to be the font of all knowledge. We wanted us to have a very transdisciplinary approach. And since 2019, the team has published almost, I think now it's over 40 articles, government reports, conference papers, and, and a book as well um, on earthquake early warning, which is Beth Reddy's book called Alerta. It's fantastic. Um, so we have had a broad group and we wanted and we wanted to take this approach um, for specific reasons. And so I want to go over some of the studies that we've conducted that have been conducted by uh, the social science working group members for Shake Alert. So this is my research actually I'm going to be talking about first. Um, and this is around can wireless emergency alerts be useful for Shake Alerts for Shake Alert. Um, I'm the lead author and I want to thank all of my wonderful co-authors, Daniel Sumi and Andrea Lennis particularly. It was published in Safety Science in 2003. Um, and the reason why we wanted to go about this research, and if you've ever received an alert on your phone, um, it's likely to have been a wireless emergency alert. And it uses a system called iPause, which is the Integrated Public Alerts and Warning System. It's run by FEMA. 
And what we found was that there was little in the literature regarding the known data latency or, or data lag, how long it takes from messages to go from point A to point B. Um, so we wanted to study this because you only found two studies in the literature and they were computerized simulations. It's really important that time is very critical for ShakeAlert. Unlike other systems, ShakeAlert it only has typically about 10 seconds of warning. And that's been the case in California for the for the large part that we've been alerting. So we don't have a lot of time to alert and that means every second counts and we didn't we need to know what those seconds mean. So we also wanted to know if the geofence. So when you get an alert, we only alert a certain area. We wanted to know if that maintained. Remember, this is 2019, so we were still on 4G technology and geofencing was fairly new. Um, so we also wanted to know if technological privilege existed. That meant if you own a smartphone, will you get an alert by a wireless emergency alert faster than someone who has a non-smartphone? For those of you who love your schematics, this is your moment. Um, this is the alert generation of the USGS Shake Alert system and it going to FEMA iPaws. And then this is basically what the system looks like. There is no human involved in making the decision as to whether an alert is sent. That decision has been predetermined and then the system runs autonomously without humans because we don't have time for a human to make a decision. So we pre-programmed everything uh, with a, a series of algorithms developed by partners. And then we send out an alert and the alert goes to app providers. It goes through smartphone, um, like smartphone operators like Google Android, and then it also goes out through wireless emergency alerts. So we'd never done this this, uh, this study before, so we had to make up a method. Um, and so what we did is we did a live test. We tested Oakland and the County of San Diego. Thank you if you're from Oakland or from the County of San Diego. In 2019, we sent out an alert and we filmed the a bank of phones, all different makes and models on a table with, a, with clocks. So we could clock the exact second when alerts were sent and we had it so it would the alert would pop up on the phone there would be a display then we also sent out a survey to residents and people working in oakland and in san diego to do the same thing at home so we could look at what their latencies might be um so community uh people would self-report their receipt times and we had it in spanish and in english so we wanted to triangulate the data. Basically, we had a control test with the phones on the table. That was the defensible data where we knew we could we could stand on. And then we would have the community based survey that we could also use to inform the data. And we tested 35 phones for our technical test. That was our defensible baseline test and 70 phones in San Diego and it includes all makes, models, network speeds and providers. We then received a thousand survey responses in Oakland and 3200 in San Diego. And honestly, it's really interesting because we alerted 40 city blocks and 40,000 people in Oakland and the entire county of San Diego and 4 million people. And the latency was pretty much the same. The fastest alert in Oakland was received in four seconds and the other fastest alert in San Diego was six seconds. So the physical phone types just revealed very little in terms of differences. It didn't really matter what kind of phone you had. In fact, the fastest phone that we had in the San Diego test, we purchased 20 minutes before the test from a local convenience store, and it was a $20 track phone. Um, and that was the fastest one in the San Diego test, which we were we were thrilled with because it means that the 14% of the population who do not have smartphones for whatever reason, affordability, accessibility, for whatever reason, um, they can get a shake alert message as fast as someone who has a smartphone. Um, the median latency for San Diego, well, for Oakland was 5.5 seconds, and for San Diego, it was eight seconds. And the community-based surveys, Oakland was 10 seconds and San Diego was 11 seconds. So then we asked, okay, well, is iPause useful for delivering wireless emergency alerts for shake alert? So we compared it to historical quakes. And the main one I'm going to be talking about now is Loma Prieta. Um, in 1989, San Francisco had Shake Alert been around to end on wireless emergency alerts now. I'm not talking about apps, just wireless emergency alerts. Uh, San Francisco and Oakland would have received 18 seconds of notice, which is actually a pretty good amount of time. 
So that's the wireless emergency alert study. I want to talk quickly about great expectations for earthquake early warning for the West Coast United States. University of Washington is the lead institution with Professor Adam Bostrom um, at, at University of Washington leading this research with in partnership with Julia Becker at Massey University in Aotearoa, New Zealand, myself and Lori Peake at the Natural Hazard Center. Now, the University of Washington graciously led this research um, with funding from the National Science Foundation to understand the basic knowledge people had around the shake alert system. Um, and it replicates a study in Japan and a study in New Zealand. Um, and then there is now uh, countries in Europe and Mexico are also putting out surveys. And we've actually conducted another survey in April and May of last year, and hopefully the results will be published soon. The main question we wanted to know was, how prepared are people of the West Coast United States for earthquakes? And what do they want and know about ShakeAlert, the earthquake early warning system? What we found out in terms of seeing or hearing information about how to respond to earthquake shaking, protective actions like drop, cover, and hold on, it's about 71% in California. And then uh, in Oregon, it was a little bit lower and in Washington, a little bit less. So around 62 to 63% in these respectively. And then the practicing of the drill, California had almost um, had almost over over 60 percent um, and about 50 percent in Oregon and Washington. And then seen or heard anything about how to respond to earthquake early warning was even less at around 41 percent in California and then around 38, 39 percent and then participated in training and exercises when went down and down and down. And what we found was is that people who had no quake experience were much less likely to be aware of what to do in earthquakes than people who had some earthquake experience. Now, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, how do people want to get an alerts? And we weren't entirely sure, but we took a punt and we decided to have an alert by a cell phone and smartphone app. And by and large, the survey respondents agreed at 90%. So we, we got it right. We got it right in terms of how people want to be alerted. The next uh, method of alerting is teenage, uh, TV messages, then public announcements, radio messages, social media, and it goes down and down and down from there. And then one of the key questions we've asked ourselves for a long time is what should be, when should people receive an alert? What kind of shaking should they receive an alert? So we asked them, questions about when they wanted to receive an alert. And 41% uh, the, the the largest one was with mild shaking with dishes, windows and doors shaking um, was what they wanted that. And that's actually what we alert for um, is around this. It's a little bit lower for apps, but this is a, what it's about for wireless emergency alerts. Wireless emergency alerts are slightly higher. It's a magnitude five excuse me, with a 3.5 shaking. Um, it's, it's a little bit higher because of the public safety impacts of sending out a wireless emergency alert, whereas apps is an opt-in, so it's a little bit lower because people are wanting to get alerts. So we're actually doing pretty good in terms of what we what when we implemented the thresholds. So just a summary. Um, in Washington, California, and Oregon, not so scary earthquake experiences are definitely the norm. Most have not experienced mass injury, damage, or loss from earthquakes. But drop, cover, and hold on was also not the norm. And this is actually backed up by a lot of research that the most likely thing you're going to do in an earthquake is freeze. What we're what we were, were wanting to see over time is that earthquake early warning can help close that information gap and trigger protective action faster, given the limited amount of time people have to take um, protective actions. Um, only about half of the respondents thought that damaging earthquakes would happen in their area, and the majority thought it would not, it would affect them if it did though. And only 11% of Oregon and Washington had heard of Shake Alert before their rollouts. Remembering this happened, the survey was done before the rollouts. And then it was much higher in the state of California. I think it was around 29%. Um, and then large majorities think Shake Alert will help protect them and others and give them useful information and find the system valuable. Now I'm going to go into the video analysis project, um, and that's led by Dara Baldwin at the University of Oregon and myself. 
and we're analyzing uh, different earthquakes, Anchorage and um, I mean, you talked about An Anchorage and Ridgecrest and a little bit about Haiti, but we've collected, I think now over 3000 videos from earthquakes around the world as well as in the United States. So I think we've all gone to Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or TikTok or one of those social media channels out there and seen earthquake videos. What we did is we actually brought those in and analyzed people's behavior. Now we can go out and we can survey people and ask them what they did, but oftentimes they may only tell you one thing that they did. The value of video is that it gives you a whole sequence of what people did and how long it took them to get there, what they said to each other, what social dynamic was going on. It gives us pretty rich data, but I also wanna just flag some limitations here around this. Um, you know, analysis of human behavior for public available video really was pioneered in New Zealand and in China. Um, so we want to just flag that, you know, we're not, we're replicating a great deal of work that has already been done. Um, and in terms of limitations to consider, we were nervous about this kind of research because we don't want to encourage people to stop what they're doing and film and stop their protective action, right? Just for the value of research, because you know we would rather people be safe and uninjured than have the research that we have. Also understanding that it, that filming can psycho may psychologically interfere with taking appropriate protective actions. And also remembering that these videos may misrepresent central tendencies of behavior. Um, this may apply to, particularly to videos taken on phones rather than on CCTV footage or ring cameras or things that are stabilized, uh, securely mounted video cameras. Um, and videos posted on to social media can be sensationalistic as well, um, which is another way these videos may fail to capture more uh, centralized human experience and behavior in natural hazard events like earthquakes. So in terms of case studies with Anchorage, um, what we did is we worked with EERI and we developed, which is the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and we developed what's called Virtual Emergency Response Teams, or VERTS. And we asked them, we asked a whole group of people who volunteered to go and scrub the internet to find these videos for us. And we collected in the initial deployment in Anchorage over 50 videos. It's really interesting because more and more videos pop up over time, even a year or two or even three years later, you still find new videos or people just upload them randomly to different social media channels. And they use an assortment of, so we found an assortment of locations and people. Um, and then Haiti, we also did another vert as well. Um, and this was the 2021 Haiti earthquake where we collected over 120 videos in the initial deployment. And we had search terms were translated into Haitian Creole by volunteers as well. And we had um, Haitian Creole speakers uh, searching and helping us. Uh, we also downloaded all the videos for later use because sometimes these videos get removed very quickly by these platforms for all kinds of reasons. And so we, we downloaded them and the University of Oregon uh, maintains that repository. Um, now for the platforms for searching for videos, we examined many of the different social media platforms and we determined about three were really the, the primary ones that we use, mostly because of their ability to search their data use, user policy, accessibility and searching. Now I'm going to show you one of the videos we found in Anchorage. And again, if you are sensitive to watching these kinds of videos, I just want to flag this for you because this is the start of two videos that I'm going to show as part of this presentation. And this is in an Anchorage school. Um, Don't let yourself be convinced to do something that you know is bad. And then Ian, why don't you share with us? So this was a map at the 7.1 that occurred in late November in Anchorage. And I won't show you all the video, but one of the one of the really interesting features of the video is how fast everyone does drop cover and hold on. So what this indicates to us clearly is that there were drills going on in the school. And the slowest person to go down, and we we 
we analyzed it down to the second. It's about four seconds. It was the teacher because the teacher was watching to make sure all of the other all of the students were down safely. So this shows the power of drills and what drills do. Drills produce what we call procedural knowledge. Sometimes it's you called muscle memory. Uh, it works like have you ever driven to work? and you've driven to work a thousand times and you don't remember how you got there well you're using muscle you're using procedural knowledge right you're using knowledge you've already had before you've created a procedure and it just happens well this is what drills do this is the value of drills is that the more drills that you do the more earthquake drills that you do the quicker you can respond because it doesn't feel awkward now here's another decision uh that was made in a private home and i'm not showing showing you this to criticize any individuals in the footage. I'm just showing how different choices are made. I've been in very big earthquakes myself and I haven't always taken the recommended protective action, so I have nothing but empathy and compassion for anyone who are in these videos. Whoa, earthquake. So you can see different choices are made here. He chose to remove his children and himself from the household. Now, we don't recommend uh, evacuation in the United States because particularly in these single story or two story family homes, they're wood frame, they flex, they rarely collapse. Um, and what we know from the literature is that you're twice as likely to be injured during shaking if you're moving. And I'll get more into that literature base in a moment. But what's important to remember here is the interactions that are happening, the conversations that are happening, how people are interacting with each other, and then the decisions that they're making with the time that they have. So for Anchorage, we have been able to get school hallway footage, school classrooms, residents, courthouse lobbies, courthouse courtrooms, the airport, a number of facilities. One of my favorite ones that we have is of a, it's a CCTV footage one, so the camera is static and it's looking down at a parking lot. And someone was in a porta potty when the shaking happened and they booked it out of the porta potty as quickly as possible and got into the middle of the parking lot. And there is no protective action that is recommended for porta potties. But I have to say, I back that person's approach 100%. Um, that is probably the approach I would also take. I want to give you a little bit of the back end of our videos here in our video analysis. So when we're going through, we use a program called Elon. Um, it is provided uh, by the Max. Um, I forget one of the institutes in the, in the in Europe. It's a video analysis software, and we take each line, and each line represents a thread of data, whether it is um, we document what people are saying to each other, who is doing what, where, what action, frame by frame, second by second, to understand what everyone is doing. Yes, it takes you, it takes a lot of time to do all of this annotation and development, um, but I think it's really worth it. So that is that, uh, that piece of research. It is ongoing. We're at the cusp of putting a couple papers in review, including a paper on the Tonga uh, eruption in 2022 and associated tsunami. We have uh, tsunami videos from 11 different countries as well as the eruption videos. And that's going to be in a paper around multi hazards. So that'll be an interesting paper to show. And we have over 600 videos for that one. So the next one is how did we know that drop, cover, and hold on was the best approach for shake alert? And if you look at the screen on the cell phone where it says earthquake detected, drop, cover, and hold on, protect yourself. Um, this is the recommended protective action, and it's important to contextualize drop, cover, and hold on as a suite of protective actions, right? It's not just drop, cover, and hold on. If you're in bed, stay in bed. If you're outside, stay outside. If you're in a car, move very slowly, slow down and move, you know, very, very slowly as you can to um, decrease your speed with what you can do. So it's a, it's a suite of protective actions, and that's how we conceptualize it. But we wanted to know, did we get it right? Are there other protective actions that could be considered? Um, and so what we did is we reviewed, felt we reviewed um, uh, earthquake injury reports from 1960 to present day. And um, when, when we accounted for all of those earthquake injury reports, we looked at 
um, countries that had similar West Coast style construction. And what we found was, particularly in Loma Prieta, Northridge, and in the Nisqually earthquake in 2001 um, in Seattle, uh, well, in Nisqually, um, we found that people were twice as likely to be injured with, during shaking. And the value of drop carbon hold on, or DC, um, DCHO, is that it reduces people's movement. So in most cases, when you consider that Shakler only provides a few seconds of advance notice, it's really not a lot of time to evacuate people or take other actions that involve a lot of movement. It's also one of the only protective actions <clears throat> that has actions recommended for people with disabilities and access and functional needs. Evacuation is pretty difficult for people who have access and functional needs um, and cannot make it out the door as fast as other people who do not. So we have to be compassionate and considerate for what people can do. And Drop, Cover, and Hold On has those recommended actions for people in wheelchairs, with canes, with walkers, and other devices. So there is a suite of protective action to consider all different um, needs of people. And Drop, Cover, and Hold On is what is taught in ShakeOut and what people are educated to do. So the system really warns you that shaking is coming and it encourages people to take action. And what you would already do if there was earthquake shaking, even if you didn't have the extra added few seconds of shake alert. And that's why we decided on drop cover and hold on. And that's in a paper that I first authored in 2022. So let's go to drills for a second, because I talked about procedural knowledge um, and why it's so important. And what are some of the barriers for why people don't want to do shakeout? Well, a study from 2012 to 2015, and I'm the first author on this paper, um, in New Zealand suggests that there was a wide variety of why people didn't do drop, cover, and hold on. Now, there were over 9,000 people observed um, during these drills. And the main barrier to doing the drill was, interestingly enough, people observed that other people were too embarrassed to do the drill, that they found the drill somehow embarrassing. Um, we were surprised by this, and this was the case in 2012 and 2015. So two different years, the number one answer of, what, of from the observers of why people didn't do it was embarrassment. It was much less than fragility, age, or disability. There was a lack of belief in the success of the action, so there's some skepticism of drop, cover, and hold on. Um, people are working or busy, and caretakers of children tend to prioritize the safety of their children to themselves. Um, so those are some of the barriers. So how can we overcome this? Well, I'm just going to go for embarrassment really quickly because embarrassment is one of my favorite topics. Um, it's a social emotion. It's an emotion that you can only feel when you're with other people or when you imagine other people or could be watching you and would be embarrassed if they saw you. Um, and it's a very much a social norming and social milling process. So how can we overcome um, how do we overcome embarrassment? Well, humor is a great tool to humanize people and humanize the act, humanize, drop, cover, and hold on, visual aids and messaging. And I really love humor research. I actually have a whole paper on humor research and the USGS uh, and GNS science and their use of humor in during crisis. It was the Kilauea eruption and the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, um, and how critical humor can actually be to communicating empathy, compassion, and information in differing ways. Um, and the other way we can do it is we can just do more drills. So we make it less awkward and we normalize the behavior. So that's a brief tour of Shake, shake Alert. I'm gonna quickly go over my other project that I work on, which is around aftershock forecasting. Now you may not be aware, but in the United States, after a magnitude five or above earthquake that occurs in the United States and the associated territories, we release what's called an aftershock forecast, which is a probabilistic, uh, it's, a, it's a dissemination of authoritative information about time dependent probabilities to help communities prepare for potentially destructive earthquakes. And we have been testing this method for decades at the US Geological Survey. Um, but we struggle to communicate these clear and effectively to different audiences, different publics. And at the USGS, we used communication science to develop the aftershock forecast product. Communicating forecasts is very complicated because earthquakes in particular come often without notice other than shake alert. 
And so information delivered to users are often delivered in the midst of a big event and people are responding, they're overloaded, and earthquakes have a high percentage of trauma associated to the event because of its sudden onset. The scientific forecasts also are uncertain and calculated in terms of probabilities, which can be complex and confusing to people. Um, and authority and expert perspectives are increasingly challenged and held within skepticism of audiences. And again, I talked about the culture of science and one way communication and exclusionary uh, social structures. So we've been doing social science research on USGS aftershock forecasting products for years now, first starting out in New Zealand in Christchurch um, with Julia Becker and Anne Wine leading. And then I did a media and social media analysis on ad hoc advisories in Bombay Beach. And then we did uh, afterwards when we created a template, which is automated now by the USGS and comes out after a magnitude five, then Andy Michael and myself led a study on media, um, what media made of these templates. There's also research being conducted and led uh, by Dr. Jennifer Santos Hernandez at the University of Puerto Rico and visualization research led by the fantastic Max Schneider, uh, who is one of our Mendenhall fellows at the US Geological Survey. So we've been communicating aftershock forecasts like this. Um, and one of the first things we say is be ready for more earthquakes. Why do we say that? Well, if you're getting an aftershock forecast, typically more earthquakes are going to come. And aftershocks and earthquakes are the same thing. They're just, we call them a different name because of the relationship to a main shock. So a big earthquake and then all of the associated earthquakes after that that are in a proximity of that earthquake. We say be ready for more earthquakes because if people are confused by probabilities, they don't want a lot of percentages, they don't know what to do with the information, what we want them to know is more earthquakes are coming and we want them to prepare for that. Then the second thing we do is we give them protective action advice um, based on the drop, cover and hold. We give them that advice. And then we talk about the probabilities of what we think can happen next and we go through it in increasing complexity, creating what we call the hierarchy of information. We start simply and then gather more and more complexity as we go. And this is what the Puerto Rico earthquake aftershock forecast looked like when it initially came out. The other thing we do now is sometimes we release scenarios. This is an example of the scenarios we've released for the Turkey earthquake. So we don't release aftershock forecasts globally, only for the United States and associated territories. And we start here first with empathetic messaging, because one of the things we know that if we don't show compassion and care that we're feeling as scientists, then when we're saying difficult information, people may not understand why we're communicating the information. And the information why we want to communicate this information is we want to help people make the best decisions for themselves, their families and their communities. And then we break it down into three different scenarios. Scenario one is most likely. So an earthquake is going to happen and there's going to be continued earthquakes, but they're not going to be as large. Then scenario two is typically what we call a doublet or slightly larger. And then scenario three is a much bigger earthquake. So this is like the magnitude eight earthquake. The reason why we break it down to three and not two is because people often want to know what's the biggest earthquake that can occur and then what's going to, so scenario three and then scenario one. But we really want to talk about scenario two, which is an earthquake of similar or even slightly smaller or slightly larger size, because that's an earthquake that can cause a lot of damage as well. So it's important to be aware of that. And we have additional visualization products we've now added here to the aftershock forecast. So that is the end of my talk. Um, I hope that it answered questions on why, uh, how people behave and react to earthquakes and associated information, why it's study of the US Geological Survey. It's here to improve our communication products and to understand the richness of human experience. So we, so we, can, we can do our job better and better every day. It's an evolving and growing area at the US Geological Survey with new projects and research being conducted all the time. And shake alert and aftershock forecasts have been developed and grown through the use of social sciences. So if anyone has any questions, thank you so much for attending, uh, attending my talk. Thank you, Sarah, that was, that was great. Um, we do have some questions. And let me get to them here. Hang on a second. Uh, Wendy asked, in recent years, we've seen some depressing examples of certain publics 
not accepting valid scientific information. Have you encountered that? And if so, how does it affect your approach to providing important information about natural hazards? It's a great question. Um, certainly, there is one study that indicates that we're in the third generation that has decreasing levels of trust in science. And um, so it can be frustrating when when people maybe don't listen to you. So you so we have to understand that you know we can provide information, we can make it conversational, we can make it available, we can try different channels, we can try different mediums. One of the things that I like to do is is um, what I consider relational communication theory. So uh, using different champions of information. So maybe they don't trust the US Geological Survey. Maybe they'll trust their local emergency manager more. Maybe they'll trust their local uh, community organizer more. Maybe they'll trust the pastor at their church more. So outreaching and engaging with different different potential champions um, uh, or what we call community based messengers uh, and having them assist us in terms of figuring out better formats for communication to their particular public and what key messages may land and be useful to them. But it's a, it is a challenge. It's a fantastic question. OK, yeah, it was um, from Paul wants to know, do you have a geologist researcher? Do I have a geologist researcher? I have 100 geologist researchers. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, so to give you a context of the amount of social scientists who do what I do at the US Geological Survey, I was the first social scientist hired at the Earthquake Science Center. And then uh, Max Schneider, my postdoc, he's a statistician, but he also has tr cross training in social science. So he was the second and I was hired six years ago. So social science, again, is still very new and we're a growing field within the US Geological Survey. There's a lot more geologists at the US Ge uh, USGS than there is social scientists. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, another question from Oscar. If the Cascadia Fault Zone were to rupture, would Southern California receive an alert? Would Southern California receive an alert? Um, so there is a paper out about some of this modeling that uh, Jeff McGuire did. It would depend what part of Southern California, and it would depend if you're talking about apps versus um, wireless emergency alerts. I, I It would depend also where on Cascadia. I mean, if you're talking up in Washington or Oregon, maybe not. If you're talking Northern California, possibly. Um, it really would just depend on a number of factors. So I don't want to say anything definitively. Also remembering that I'm not a seismologist, so I would be speaking way outside my field at the moment by guessing. Yeah, I, I would tend to think that tsunamis would be a bigger threat than the actual shaking. I think it just really depends. I think it just really depends on where it is and, and, right. and a number of factors. Right. OK, um, question from Anonymous. You do such important work for the American people. Thank you. Do you see a future where shake alert is more broadly publicized? Why isn't this shared to the public more on local and national news in a oh, that's more productive, a, proactive manner? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that we're definitely growing as a system, and I think we're utilizing all the time. Anytime there is an alert going out, I think we're pretty proactive and productive. Um, yeah. It's a great question. I'm not sure I have a correct answer here for you, but I know that there are people at the USGS who work very hard to try to promote ShakeAlert as much as they can. Yeah, at the end of that question is the work USGS does on earthquake early warning is too important to be a secret. And totally agree with that. Um, yeah, I agree too. I think it's pretty phenomenal that it, that it exists. Okay, this is more of a question. Um, you may says you might want to specify the year of the Anchorage earthquake when she first mentioned it. I thought she meant 1964 and wondered how the researchers could have collected many videos from that time period. 
So that's a fantastic question for a couple of reasons and a statement. 2018 was when it happened. Uh, that was the 7.1. And there's a number of big earthquakes. Uh, so thank you very much for helping me with that. Number two, there's actually some fantastic video from 1964 um, that we actually have around uh, tsunami behavior and shaking and human behavior. So as long ago as that was, we actually do have film from that time. And I'm in the process of taking a look at that footage and seeing what people did right now. So yeah, there's a, that's a, yeah. There's a very famous photo of a, a guy got a camera for Easter and he was out filming the harbor there in, in, in Anchorage. <laughs> I remember seeing that years ago and thought, wow, that was that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, another question is, where do people learn about DCHO and participate in drills if they are not in school? Another great question. Um, Drop, curb and hold on is is run by the Earthquake Country Alliance and SCEC, the California Earthquake um, Group. Um, so you can just Google ShakeOut and you can sign up for a drill. It will give you resources uh, if you register for the drill. And I do recommend people do the drill outside of home, outside of schools, as well as like in your home to sign up to do the drill in your workplaces, because the more experience you have in different locations in terms of what to do in your knowledge, uh, the faster you will be able to respond in different locations. There's actually a really interesting study and it's on the shakealert.org website. Um, it's called the Generational Gap and it was led by Rachel Adams and Lori Peek at the Natural Hazard Center, again funded by the National Science Foundation, looking at the Anchorage schools um, and the parents at home and the differences between all the different groups of people. We found a substantive generational gap where children are taught to do drop, cover and hold on but their parents aren't necessarily told what to do. Some of the parents were taught to go into doorways, this really common one. We haven't had go into doorways for over 30 years in terms of um, around protective action in the United States, and they didn't really know what to do. And so there's this generational gap. So I really want to encourage people to do the drills at home and at all phases of life. Yeah, you're more likely to be at home when there's an earthquake hits anyway. That's right. Um, Okay, a couple more questions here. Are there any other quick training messages sent out over shake alert in periods between earthquakes that remind people what to do so they aren't taken off guard when the earthquake hits? That's a great question. So just to clarify, the USGS runs the monitoring network and we organize shake alert as 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 a system but we have distribution partners that send out the alerts for us. And that includes app providers, it includes smartphone um, providers, and that includes wireless emergency alerts, which is iPaws. Um, so app providers have sent out messages, um, test messages and all kinds of things over the, over the years um, in terms of letting people know. Uh, and that's the, probably, that, that, that's how it's been used because people sign up for that. They agree to get that information. Um, smartphone phone providers who are running the operating systems don't necessarily do that because people don't always sign up to get the alerts. So it's only if you sign, you know. So, so I guess the, the, the smartphone, the app providers have done that in the past. Uh, in terms of reminders, but we wouldn't probably do that as the USGS because of the way that the system is organized, the difference between the distribution partners and the USGS. Okay, and looks like our last question. Um, do you work to develop messages in other languages or with minority groups to tailor messaging? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and this is really important. So for shake alert when we have done message modification for the wireless emergency alerts we've developed the messages first in spanish then in english and the reason that, that is is because spanish tends to be a little bit longer the words are longer and we also needed to really understand the different cultural contexts and different types of spanish that are being used currently in um for wireless for wireless emergency alerts it's only in english and spanish um, also, app, app providers also provide in different languages as well. So yes, absolutely, we consider cultural contexts, we consider language contexts too when we're looking at message development. 
Okay, and we do have one, well, one last question here. Um, in places that don't receive earthquake training in schools or have a low probability of earthquakes, what would you recommend state geological surveys do to communicate hazard risk? It's a really good question around low probability, high, high impact events, because what we know is that there's places that earthquakes are less likely to happen, but if they do happen, they may be a lot worse than in places that have a higher frequency because of the way that building construction is. So even though there's a lower probability, it's really important that drills be considered to be embedded in school curriculums and in workplaces and in homes and talk about these things. Talking about historic earthquakes, so many um, of our states have historic earthquakes. I think one of my favorites was in Massachusetts. I think it's the 1755 Charlotte, Queen Charlotte, maybe earthquake. And it was like a magnitude 6.4 off the coast. And it would be hugely damaging if it happened today. And um, it's a really interesting earthquake. And then you have Charlotte as well. You have a number of places that have had earthquakes in the past. And talking about historic earthquakes is a great way to talk to people about, hey, we've had earthquakes in the past. This can happen. So that would be a recommendation in terms of pointing to different events, even maybe a cross border, but you know, might be something that people relate to and understand. So I know it's hard that these low probability, high impact events are really complicated to talk about, but I would always encourage um, there to be public education campaigns, even in low probability areas. Because earthquakes yeah. can happen anywhere at any time. And also your state population, they might be on holiday somewhere in another part of the country that has a high earthquake risk and they wouldn't know what to do if they hadn't received any information or training even about earthquakes that might happen in other areas. So it's thinking about your population in terms of both location of where you're at, but also where they may be at as well in the future. Yeah, I remember talking to a customer that came into our office after the Loma Prieta earthquake and he was frightened to death by that earthquake and he's he was ready to move back to Charleston, South Carolina, where he came from. And I just <laughs> said, you know, you might want to look at this USGS bulletin we did on the 1886 Charleston earthquake. Yeah. And he like took it over, sat down and he spent about 45 minutes reading it. And he came back, to, came over to me, you know, very, said, thank you very much. I think I'm staying here. Uh, <laughs> so, the, you know, I think, and that's a brilliant way. And I think it's really important to contextualize earthquakes as well. Earthquakes can, can be scary. They can be damaging. But if you love the mountains, you love the scenery, oftentimes earthquakes are part of those natural processes. We just live on the earth and the earth does what it wants to do. Um, and I think it's just important to talk about it in a way that's not fearful um, or inflammatory and, and in much more of a conversational way. So yeah, it's, it's a great, great question. I think you handled it really, really well, Mitch. It was, yeah, no, it was, it, that was a very interesting time to be working here. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was half, you were half scientist, half psychologist because People would literally call you and they, they just needed somebody to talk to about their experience and we were it. Um, thank you again for uh, talking to us tonight, Sarah. It was a very great talk and for answering all those questions from our audience. And again, all thank you. Thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. This lecture will be available for on-demand viewing in about a week on our website at www.usgs.gov slash PLS. You can also see many of our previous recordings on the website under the multimedia section for videos. We've been doing this public lecture for nearly 30 years now. If you would like to subscribe to be part of our monthly mailing list, please feel free to send us an email at WMCESIC at usgs.gov and we will happily add you to the list.